good evening. I'm going to call the uh, Town of Barnstable Shellfish Committee meeting to order on this uh, September 11th, 2024. Uh, and I must first read this notice of recording. Please note that tonight's meeting is recorded and broadcast on the Town of Barnstable's Government Access Channel and in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 20. I must inquire whether anyone is taping this meeting, and if so, please make their presence known. Anybody else taping besides the town? Great. Before we get into this, I'd just like to acknowledge the fact that this is September 11th, and uh, I can't believe it's as long as it's been since that occurred. 23 years. 23 years. So a uh, moment of silence, I think, would be in, a, in order. Thank you. Um, first order of business, let's approve the uh, meeting minutes for the August 14, 2024 meeting. Move approval. They've been moved. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of uh, approving the minutes as presented, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Thank you. Uh, chairman's comments, I don't have any at this time. Natural Resources Report, please. Amy. Okay, so from Shellfish Technician Ryan Henry, um, here's what the team has been up to this past month. 46 and a half bushels of cohogs have been dug up and moved throughout the three base system. They began planting the cohogs on bottom and will continue to do so for the next couple of months. As of right now, they have 20 nets planted. Um, they finished planting the oysters at Bridge Street and have started planting oysters on the north side of town ahead of pending oyster season. Rendezvous Lane has been open to commercial and recreational harvest. We just have one very long net of propagation area closure there. That's the equivalent of close to 20 nets in one. Um, the rest of our time has been um, using to take care of the oysters and cohogs that remain in the floating upwelder, cleaning the cohog nets and maintaining their gear. Um, I have the numbers, uh, 2023 year to date compared to 2024 year to date. Um, pretty much on par. We're still, you know, like less than 200 this time behind. No, right around 200. Um, but we also have oyster season pending, so I imagine we'll sell more permits when that happens. I don't know if anybody at Scudder has noticed the installation of no parking signs um, all the way up to the corner at Scudder. Um, there were concerns from the people who live on some of those harder to access um, streets and driveways that access could be impeded should there be a medical emergency. There was a meeting with my department, um, I want to say the police department, the fire department and parking compliance uh, back in early spring and they had, the, the fire department had expressed some concerns and so I knew this was coming, didn't know when. Um, kind of wish they had done it <laughs> earlier around all those nice tides we had this summer when parking still was up around the corner. Um, but this will be implemented for oyster season, which will you know, mean that uh, people who have stickers still can park in the upper and lower lot. People who do not have stickers that will be parked on the road will have to walk further than they normally do. Hopefully this will alleviate some of the congestion issues um, coming to and from that in particular landing. Um, does anyone have any questions about the year-to-date numbers? Okay. So moving on, updates on the dry dragging management plan. So um, I've received some comments from um, wild harvesters who have dry dredges um, that include like the specifications of them, what types of teeth they have, what their capacity is. Um, I am going to meet with a gentleman named Jay Sistaro who builds them for a living and who is a wild harvester but out of Rock Harbor so doesn't have like an inherent bias towards anything that's decided in this town. It's all just a continuation of fact finding for me because obviously I'm not a wild harvester. I don't pretend to be. I don't know much about commercial cohog dragging in that sense. And so I want to make sure as we move towards a future dry drag fishery that we have regulations that will hold up for, you know, years to come. 
Um, if I did hear back from the state, which was very interesting, um, they have said that under 13052, the town has jurisdiction over um, most of our fisheries should we choose to manage them out to three miles. I was told previously by DMF1, but I believe Jared versus the other man who retired because he's actually a policy analyst and part of the legal team for DMF. Um, what I cannot do and do not have jurisdiction over are the state managed fisheries. So the request that was made last month to look into our possible jurisdiction out to either one mile or in this case three miles over like ocean cohoggers and surf clamors is not a thing. They are state permitted to do so. I have no authority over them. So that was a really interesting thing. So I'm still working with GIS to um, get that line, although I think the three mile line is like as established on charts, you yeah. know, elsewhere. And so it shouldn't be as hard of a lift. And I say, you know, whatever, if we have jurisdiction out to three miles, if you can find cohogs <laughs> three miles offshore, by all means do. Um, still leaning 20 bushels um, per day six days a week with the understanding that you cannot fish like say you know Cape Cod Bay and then go get another limit in three bays somewhere um, and we I'll have maps next month of what our team has decided are going to be the no dragging zones for the season um, we've established that there will be no dragging in the Marston Small River we're going to give it a break for at least a year maybe two um, and we've also established that uh, designated relay areas are off the table um, I have the bathymetrics for our embayments and we'll make best management decisions to protect the people who are going either from shore or who long raking and sort of creating a separation between um, those kind of user conflicts. Yeah. Um, and yep, I think those were all the things I needed to check into before um, this meeting this month. So I'll have maps next month. We can move forward with our management plan and we'll continue to, you know, look at what these future regulations for that future fishery will be. Okay. Any questions? Jake? Uh, would it be possible to maybe try to get the line that is on like that SC18 uh, area with that? If you look, it has like, it's hard to see with the dotted town boundary. Yeah, so what we're doing is using what our GIS determines as our town boundary. DMF does not determine where your town boundary starts and where it ends. Um, they have their area classifications, which are what those maps show. So we'll be going out from what our dotted lines are of our town boundaries to three miles. And that's going to be what it is. Have you, on that particular uh, SC18, like, have you seeing that there is like in the legend at the bottom it literally says town boundary so then it's probably dotted. based off of our gis anyway yeah okay but um like in certain situations uh where we have like you know we our our, our shoreline is extremely contoured you know we, we go in you know from basically like if you drew a line from weano over to point gammon at the deepest part from craigville beach to basically Collier's Ledge, which is kind of like inshore, is probably, you know, instead of having like a contour line, if the DMF agrees or like is okay with having this box that is already on their charts, could we just go with what the DMF, because it's, well, what's a bigger area is better, I'm sure most people agree, and two, it's like a straight line kind of thing, instead of like this, you know what, what I'm saying? I'm, what I'm going with is going to be what's easiest for us to actually enforce should that need to be done. And so I thought I made that pretty clear in the last meeting. So I'm going to continue to work with our GIS department because, again, Division of Marine Fisheries does not determine where your town starts and where it ends. What would you think that actual boundary on there is like for, I guess? for determining a growing area classification. No, no, if you look on the, I think you're, it's not the growing area. This, we're talking about, if you if you pull it up, I can show you, there's actually so a So then, line like, that, the line that goes out from Papanesset is probably the town line, and the line that comes out from Hyannis Harbor no, no, is no, probably it, the town there's line. There's a dotted line that encompasses, it, like, more than, if you pull up the SC28 chart, you can see it goes down into um, NS, one and four in a very small strip on the bottom as well. Mm -hmm. It's just, they have, 
it's it literally is on the legend town boundary. I'm yeah. not talking about I know I'm saying the SC eighteen chart in that area is in green and that's what I know you're referring to, but that actually SC eighteen is bigger than our town waters. Right. And also not in, in just our town waters. Right. What I'm so. saying is I'm going to work with our town so that we're not potentially infringing on other towns, what they consider to be their boundaries based on DMF maps. It's going to be what the town determines is the town boundary. Gotcha. It's clear, right? I'm not, I, I'm not sure why the DMF didn't get a, has a chart though that I'm just not understanding what It's a map for. with a dotted line, Jake. It has no lats and longs attached to it at all. And so what I'm going to do okay. is work with our actual GIS department to determine what those actual lines so are. So you're going to do the GIS of what they have in the dotted lines to the best of your ability is what you're saying? No, what I'm going to use is what the town actually has is the town boundaries between like us and Yarmouth and us and Mashpee. Okay. Because that's what will be used to make those types of management decisions. Okay. You don't want to get into a situation where we go by some random DI DMF map. Okay. And Fair then enough. have a territory argument with a neighboring town. Fair it's enough. not. I'm understanding better now. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not going that way. Bob, you had your question, your hand up. No, I did not. Okay. I was just getting. Uh, bored. Any other questions <laughs> on the <laughs> dry dragging <laughs> management plan? Any other questions? What's the, what, what's the next step? You're just going to talk to Jay, and then we're going to come. I'm going to talk to Jay. I'm hoping to hear from more um, wild harvesters if they, you know, have a dry dredge to just provide me with additional information. And like those would be actual regulations, so that's on a longer term. Mm -hmm. um, it's a management plan for this season. So next month I'll have maps that have been drafted by my department that say like where you can go and where you can't go for this season, and we'll take it from there. All right. Thank you. Um, growing area updates. I don't know how this happened, but magically, one day after our meeting last month, the Campylobacter closure was lifted. So um, I know it wasn't because I rioted in that meeting, but it happened. So I think it was. It's finally gone. <laughs> it's finally gone. I don't think DMF staff is like sitting around watching me in these meetings, but um, but yeah. So that's finally gone, which is wonderful. Um, they did sort of shirk FDA's suggestion to come back with three completely clean samples and reopened after one, which I think was great. Yep. Um, um, definitely helps the Yarmouth growers um, who were at that point looking for other employment. Um, we have a number of map changes. The Katuit Narrows has come back clean and is slated to reopen effective October 1st. So just to kind of like, you know, skip out on some of the other maps that give you a more bird's eye view. Um, it's this area in here. So we'll be reopened October 1st all the way to the mouth of North Bay. Very awesome news. Um, for the first time in a long time, we, instead of having this map be the closure in Barnstable Harbor effective September 15, this will be the new closure. Come on, you can open. I know you can do it. There we go. Look at that. Ooh, so CCB 31.1, 31.3, and 31.4 um, will all remain open effective September 15th. They're going to continue to monitor this area here, a small portion into the prohibited area that has a very productive flat um, in these areas here and here, and will potentially make management decisions after this year's rounds of sampling, which are starting um, towards the end of the month. But um, yeah, I mean that, you know, it came from a request from the wild fishery and apparently less birds are making excrement um, in those areas, at least during that time of year. So that's pretty great. Um, and then, yeah, I think that's all just uh, September 15th. Oh, the other thing. Um, effective September 15th is we now have just over 20 boats 
in the Katuit Oyster Company mooring area. Um, the model ordinance was actually signed and is now effective, and so the mooring area policy that DMF had been promoting for close to two years now is formally accepted. And so Katuit Oyster Company mooring area and the Bridge Street mooring area will both be considered type one mooring areas and that they'll have more than 20 boats in them, but less than 20 boats that would have MSDs. And so next year, I anticipate this staying in open status and the Bridge Street mooring area staying in open status. Oh, cool. Yeah. Good it's going to be a more complex road to the Katuit Town Landing mooring area because there's so many boats there and a lot of them are capable of overnight occupancy and a lot of them will have MSDs. But Harbor Master staff is dedicated to working with me over the winter to um, create some additional drop downs when they do pump out logs to check some additional boxes that could result in us moving forward, being able to even keep this area during the summer months. Um, the Hyannis Yacht Club mooring area is off the table because that's already closed during that time of year for water quality. She's got it. Okay. And the Hyannis Port mooring area could potentially stay open but would fall under that same category, and I'd rather focus on the Katuit Town Landing mooring area first. Correct. Um, that's all I have for growing area updates. Hold on, we have a question. I have never seen anyone in the Katuit mooring area spending overnight on the boat in all the years I've been using that area. Which Katuit mooring area? The, the area by the town dock, you know. The, okay. the, there's a lot of boats there, but I've never seen anyone spend yeah. a night on their boat. Well, because we don't have compliance checks on that and because we don't have I a regulation it. that prohibits it, um, I get it. The FDA assumes that people that can will. So. Tyler, if you would come to the mic, introduce yourself, please. Uh, Tyler Hagenstein, Wild Harvester. Um, I just have a question about the 20 boat mooring uh, closure situation. Has our Conservation Commission and Waterways Commission been notified of this and how it impacts us? Um, no, because it's part of the model ordinance, so it wouldn't matter. Like it's part of Just the National Shellfish Sanitation as, like, Program's grow, model ordinance, so. As, as far as going forward and then approving new moorings or this and that. Just oh, it's not the Conservation Commission or Waterways that approves it. It's Division of Marine Fisheries because they, they're the ones that get but, audited by FDA. But they approve new moorings and things like that. They actually... Um, no. no, the no. mooring officer approves new moorings. Oh, okay. And while we have cool. open lines of communication with him in regards to plopping moorings in areas that are relay areas, recreational areas, yeah. areas of high shellfish value habitat, um, there are a lot of moorings in this town. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. Jake? Um, I, I, uh, <laughs> so it's, you're allowed to sleep on, this is, I just not know this, you're allowed to sleep on your boat? Yeah, in this town, we don't have a regulation that prohibits it. Uh, I, I was on. I, I, I thought it was. I, for some reason, I thought you weren't allowed to do that. But there are towns that have prohibitions on it, but this town does not have it in their in their regulations. Okay. Yeah. So if you want to sleep on your boat, you can. <laughs> um, and New then, biz. Yeah, I think that's. I think that's all I have. Any general questions for natural resources? Great. I'll move on to new business. Uh, chair and vice chair nominations and vote. So I'll run the meeting as chair and I'll entertain nominations for chair. DJ. I guess me. <laughs> Great. Anybody else? Okay. Um, all those in favor of uh, voting DJ, the chairman of the Shellfish Committee, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? How many said aye, please, again? Hold up. Oh, good. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Vice Chair, do we have a nomination? Bill Cherapon. Great. Um, all those in favor of Bill being the Vice Chair, signify by saying aye. 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 Great. Congratulations to the two of you. And now I'm going to hand this over to you. So you get to run the meeting. That quick, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we thought we were going to go you know. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're in new business, and we're going to go to discussion of shellfish fees. 
Uh, thank you for this opportunity to talk about uh, shellfish fees. Um, I don't believe these have been looked at since 2016, and we're in fee season, uh, especially since we're now a um, yearly permit. We follow the calendar year. And so in November, the um, town manager has a town manager hearing for calendar year fees. So I wanted to take a pass at it, uh, provide you guys some information, give you a first idea of kind of what staff and I are looking at, and see if you have any questions, any additional information that you want. Because we can review these um, suggestions and change the draft, we have this meeting and next meeting, but I would need a vote next meeting in order to follow that schedule of a November hearing. Um, so just quickly, sort of a lot of, there's always a lot of talk about the revolving fund and I want to take a minute to kind of go through and see if I can simplify it a bit for everybody. <coughs> um, we have a shellfish revolving fund. It does um, per, uh, per town council vote um, take in fees for recreational, commercial and aquaculture fees. So that's one account. We also have a what's called a general fund account. It's a shellfish general fund account. Um, that is also funding these three categories of our program. Um, and that general fund means tax based. So I'll be talking a lot about revolving fund and general fund. And it's a combination of those two that get you to our, all our programs and all of our oversight, our staff, our trucks, our uniforms, Alicia, really the whole kit and caboodle. So um, just to give you an outline, um, a revolving fund, um, it gets about uh, 173,960, that must have been last year's, uh, um, monies in the form of recreational shellfish fees. And I'm gonna break that number down a little bit more for you. Um, last year, and this is sort of typical of our fee structure, um, Commercial fees come in at about $24,500, and aquaculture fees are around $4,000. So that goes into the revolving fund. Um, how much of that money is, uh, covers expense of each of those, of those programs is the next thing I want to talk about. So and everybody following what I'm saying? So we get fees in, and we have expenses out. How much do those fees in cover expenses out? So for your recreational uh, program, um, the revolving fund or your fees cover about 38% of, of the activities uh, of the program, I should say. And this is not just propagation, folks. This is also all the enforcement that you see, all the education you see, all of, all of Amy's time and my time doing what we're doing right now. It's a bigger than just shellfish in, um, for folks to harvest. It's the whole program. So we have about 38% capture of um, revenue versus expense in the recreation uh, department, hmm. and the rest 62% is general fund or taxpayer. Um, commercial is about the same, 32% is recovered through uh, the fees for the commercial folks, 68% is general fund. And aquaculture, um, we all know that we have a state law that requires us to stay within the parameters of $25 per acre. Um, so that is by nature low, right? And it's a blue economy and this is something that the town very much supports. Uh, this, all of these programs is very much blue economy, very important to this town. Um, so 5% of those fees are recovered. I wanna just highlight with this that I'm not suggesting aquaculture fee increases at this meeting, you guys just did a huge lift with your aquaculture regulations. Um, we're gonna leave that. I do wanna say that as the director, I see that and I think that we probably should look at a processing fee or a um, some sort of little bit of recapture from that for all the work that we do just, just to process uh, aquaculture license and the hearing and the transfers and all that just takes a lot of time. So there, there might be a little additional fee in the future and I look to this committee or maybe a working group to discuss what is fair there. Um, but we certainly can break down the fees for that, for that um, activity or program. Does anybody have any questions with this before I move on and get a little deeper? Yes, Jake. Sorry, I'm, uh, I'm not a 
a good math guy, but mm -hmm. what is uh, the when you say like recovered or what does that mean? Yeah, so unfortunately I come from an enterprise account, so I have that in my mind, which mm -hmm. is uh, we're supposed to do full recovery, but in it's it's saying that we know how much it costs to run their program per year, mm -hmm. and some of that is paid by the taxpayers, and some mm -hmm. of it is paid by the actual users, the people that actually have the permits. So where do those percentages come from? So um, we looked at all of our expenses, and then I had staff go through each expense, like how much time does Amy spend in each of these buckets? Okay. Um, and so, it's not perfect science, but I wanted to get sort of an idea mm -hmm. as we do, as we explored fee increases. And like, so there generally would be like monitoring and like you know constables, and then like the paperwork. All of that. There's a portion like of, any of the uh, propagation involved in that percentage, or is it just like the cost of, of? Yeah. Yeah. So Amy does a certain amount of her work is for. Mm -hmm. uh, we do spend a lot of time doing enforcement. Yeah, um, for, for sure. recreation folks, so a bunch yeah. of Nappy's time and Amy's time. And then Katie is, spends, when she divided up her time, it was more for the aquaculture folks. So that's kind of how we, we looked through this, um, this spreadsheet to come up with these numbers. So like, um, would that mean that like the commercial or the recreation, like any of those, like, like the, rec uh, the easiest one I guess would be aquaculture, like so they bring in $4,000. But their total, um, and that's only 5% of what it costs to manage that thing. It only covers 5%. And so, like, what would the total um, of each of these roughly, is? are they equal, I guess? Like, would no, you say, no, like, no, no, it's no, like 100,000, 100,000, 100,000? No, 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 no. Recreational, uh, recreation, our recreation program costs the most. Okay. Um, and then the other ones are much, much less. How the, just curious, how does the commercial versus aquaculture compare as far as cost? Um, they're pretty similar. I want to say it's in the 50 or 60. Okay. No, it's okay. I'm just curious. I, I, thank you for that. I understand yeah. that. Yeah. The recreation is a lot. It's the majority of everybody's mm -hmm. time. Thanks. Um, yeah. Bob? It, it, it looks looking at this that the commercial people are getting a kind of a free ride and yet in your proposed fees, you're not proposing to increase their fees at all, but you are on the recreational fee. Yeah, and I and I I want to get into that a little bit more as we as we peel it apart. That is true, and aquaculture the same. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that shellfish is expected to do 100 percent no, recovery. I, I, I mean, no, this I, is I something that. that the town does support. Yeah. Um, and the cost for running the commercial shell fisheries and running the aquaculture shell fisheries is much less than when running the recreational shell fisheries. But I do agree that we should evaluate that. Yeah. And I think that was part of my first comments. It's okay. like, we, we, need, we need to evaluate that, but I'm not gonna walk in here and just like blow that up without like having a conversation with everybody, bringing uh, people from different user groups in to discuss it. So I think I wanna put a pin in that, particularly aquaculture fees, and talk about that over the next year. Does that explain it? All right, let's dive forward here. Okay, so this one is really um, interesting. Thank you, Alicia, for putting this together. So let me just take a minute to explain to you what you're saying. So um, we have from 2019 to 2023, obviously we're not gonna put 2024 up there, but you're kind of getting an idea that we're still on these trends. So um, the top dark blue line is your resident shellfish permits, the numbers sold. So, oh my goodness, there's COVID right there, right? This is all, everything I look at has COVID. Because everybody see COVID? Yeah. It just messed with everything. Um, so, yeah, I don't know why that says invalid. I don't know what happened there. Yeah. It shouldn't have. This is recreational. Yeah. This is recreational. Yeah. Thank you for clear. This uh, should no. say 1385, and this one should say 1497. I don't know what happened. Nope, me neither. So when you when you look at that trend, and again, um, that's just recreational, not seniors. This is just your recreational permits that are presently forty dollars each. Um, it's good to look at the trend line, which is the dotted line, and you can see there is a very slight uphill to that. Um, 
And then underneath in the light blue is your seniors. We have a lot of seniors. Um, and slight, uh, that one's pretty steady. So basically our residents with a little coming and going are pretty steady. What I see is how much our non-residents are increasing. And that's mm -hmm. the green line at the bottom. Um, and staff has also said that. So we have this pretty clear uphill for our non-resident permits. And that's part of the reason why it's something that we're looking at for a fee increase. Thank you, Amy. Mm -hmm. So Amy put together, I don't know, it definitely looks better on my sheets, just so everybody knows. I don't know what happened. Yes, please. Um, you want to go back? Non-residents, do they allow one permit per household, or can five people in the house get licenses? So I'll answer that question. Our regulations are weird in that there's a, a discrepancy when it comes to our management of a household and then also our management of people over the age of 18. Um, so our regulations when crafted, most people had a stereotypical household. There's like the two principal domiciled adults and then the children who are under the age of 18 that live there. That is not the common household now. Um, and for those households that still exist that way, that functions. Where it doesn't function is where you have a permit for the two principally domiciled adults and then a 20-something that has not left the household yet but wants to shellfish on their own. Our regulations require that person to get their own permit. And so we do have some households that hold more than one license for that address because of that. Um, that is something that has racked my brain for close to 18 years now because it's a loophole that is either just needs to be um, legitimized more formally to address the more common household that exists now or needs to be cleaned up in such a way that that can't happen. That's also very difficult to track, unfortunately, with our online system as I just had somebody two weeks ago that somehow managed to get two permits issued to herself and then thought that it was okay to harvest two limits of things. And because she had shown me both of her permits and I was like, hmm, I know some people have the same name, but I didn't know that those people also live at the same house and have the same birthday and the same height and weight and was like, this is a problem. So, you know, there are good things about online permitting. There are troubling things about online permitting. The regulations themselves um, kind of <clears throat> lead it to be possible for there to be more than one permit issued per household. So we definitely do see that. But by and large, most people, it's it's one or two for the household, and it's just to address the additional adults. I think especially the non-residents. I mean, I mean, they don't live in one house. Getting a Hard bunch of licenses and the kids and the grandkids, I mean, you know, on the same. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. They're taken away from the town people that are paying taxes. Right. Well, unfortunately. And I know too, but. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's something, you know, that I, I would like to look at more formally addressing. We really have to try to figure out, like, in our online tool, how many instances of that are occurring. And then is it just, you know, does it just happen every once in a while or is it an egregious issue that we're seeing with non-residents versus, I mean, there are residents that fall under that same category. You know, like they, their mom is in her, you know, 60s, 70s. They have her living at the house. She likes to go out without them. They like to go out on their own. And so you end up with two permits to that household. It doesn't bother me as much, per se, but yeah. would more. Yeah, it's, it's that, you know, that kind of comes down to the state statute. You know, we have to make a permit available to any member of the Commonwealth because, you know, even though it's a town-managed fishery, just like any saltwater fishing or freshwater fishing license, you get it and it gives you access to whatever that area is. In this case, because of home rule, it's town via a shellfish permit, but you know, if you buy a saltwater fishing license, you can fish wherever in the state, so. Okay, so thank you for that answer. Um, so this is the matrix of other towns. Um, and so I put it in um, order of highest to lowest from the resident fee. 
And so you can see at $40, we're kind of in the middle there with regard to resident fee. Um, s senior, I don't know why it looks so messed up. Seniors are kind of all over the place. Some towns select not to even charge for a senior, um, which I'm on board for, or five bucks. Um, so that's kind of a little bit um, all over the place. But certainly, non-res fees are clearly in many communities more than our fees. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I struggled with well, what, what is the product that we're providing our residents, but in particular our non-residents, since that, that's what I was looking at. And so um, Amy tried to put together like how much uh, stock is out there in the recreational fisheries. And I, and I kind of feel like Barstable is somewhat on par with uh, Wellfleet. Um, Oyster-wise, they only have 200,000, but the SPAT um, brought it up to about the, similar to ours. Yeah, it was like they had, um, they said last year they thought they had around like 550,000 that their SPAT collectors had taken in. Um, so it would be right around what, you know, we get the 690,000 single oysters, but then also do 750 remote set bags, which is like, you know, whatever, whatever the set is and turns out to be. And then you can see they have much less cohogs. Um, we do have a lot of cohogs propagated in this town, um, but they have a lot less permit holders. So, but I do kind of want to look at Wellfleet compared to us, and you can see um, that we're, there's room to grow in both resident and uh, non-resident fees if um, this board, you know, chose to or this committee chose to endorse that. So, having looked at all of this information. Um, we came up with, Staff and I sat down, and we came up with this proposal. Um, we'd like to go up $5 on the resident. Um, I want to point out that it's been since 2020, 2016. Um, the cost of shell stock is the biggest thing that's gone up, and I'm sure a couple of you are going to nod your head. I'm um, told about 15% increase. Um, so we need a place to absorb that if we want to continue to do the same amount um, of propagation that we've done. Um, and then the cost of equipment, we go through a lot of equipment, all of that has gone up as well. Um, so in my mind, that justifies you know, spreading that out a little bit, recognizing that the taxpayers are still supporting this program, but just sort of putting a little bit of that onto the users. Um, I don't think we need to go up t with seniors. I, I think uh, looking at the matrix, I think we probably should stay put with the seniors. Um, veterans, <laughs> uh, veteran and senior veteran by law has to be the exact same as your resident. That's um, so that I just wanted to put that up there to illustrate that. Can it be lower? Um, Amy. Uh, so I believe the way the BRAVE Act is written is that um, you can charge no more to a veteran than what is the resident fee. So you probably could charge less, um, but we, since that came into inception in 2016-ish, 17-ish, um, was signed into law, have just kept it consistent with the prices of our resident and senior resident permits. Does a res uh, does a veteran have to be a resident, or is it any veteran? I know, yeah. It's any vet. Well, the way that the state interprets it is any veteran of the Commonwealth. Okay. So, uh, uh, in the state of Massachusetts. I don't. I don't think we split hairs on that, though. I'm just thinking. And then the office. I mean, a veteran's a veteran. Right. But I'm yeah. thinking if they're a non-resident veteran, then they're actually getting a nice discount from the mm -hmm. right. You know, oh yeah. Look at it. There were, I mean, and when this came into effect, there were a lot of non-resident, especially senior veterans, that were like, "I'm buying a permit in every town that I can drive to." Um, biggest issue for those types of situations is access, because you know, you're allowed to get a permit doesn't necessarily come with parking. And I don't have those numbers parsed out off the top of my head. But it's a couple hundred a year, mm. at least. Does that sound about right? Yeah. Um, if you remember, if you went back to the um, shellfish permits that we had, the veteran is their own separate category. So oh, okay, yeah. Oh, do you want me to? I can go back to it if you want. 
It's just, I just wanted to illustrate that we, we do sell quite a bit. It's not the odd person. It's known, and it's used, and, and, and it's something we, we very much support. Yeah, so it's yeah. pretty consistent. So it would be the like 120-something people. Yeah. Yes, Jake? Uh, like the $170, I get the whole increase, but uh, why not make it like 200 bucks? you know? Yeah, like, that's what? like... <laughs> yeah, interesting like you said that. That came out of Nappy's milk yeah, almost definitely. immediately. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if we're, if we're producing, <laughs> I mean, you, you're you comparing to Wellfleet, mm -hmm. but if Wellfleet is getting SPAC collection, that's free seed. Yeah. And you're buying 700,000 pieces, and yes, seed, shellfish seed has gone up like crazy plus it was a bad hatchery year so then you're ending up spending more to try to make up for what you end up not getting um i mean i am totally for lift, pushing that non-resident fee uh, i mean is what number or what percentage are you guys trying to get to yeah, and, and I hear you, and I initially did put 200 in there. It's kind of weird when you write these things. You're like, 200? No, 170? No, 180? Like, but my my feeling um, from doing a lot of this at Sandy Neck, which is million, you know, millions yeah. of dollars, is that you do too big of a jump, yeah. and then people the are like, The demand nah. goes down. So Start if low. you want to take a jump that's $60, it's almost better to go up to 170 And then I think we should revisit this next year. Yeah. And yeah. then you do the second jump, yeah. and that is has less of the sticker shock mm -hmm. than jumping all the way to 200. So that's why I ended at 170, even though Nappy wanted me to go to Okay, no, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're definitely getting their money's worth if they go. 100. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Way more. Than in the in the recreational people down at the end of Cab's Pasture and stuff, the, it is a mob scene down there now. It's like it used to be like a good good effort, like a lot of people. Now it's just like. It's like a, uh, hordes coming down. <laughs> Chaos, yeah. yeah, it is. There's people littered all over the harbor that walk yeah. out to those areas on a decent tide. So it's, I yeah. This. I've got to run. Uh, somebody in my family's in the hospital. Oh, so. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You, congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we jumped ahead, but uh, we we're, were going to the 170 for the first step. Um, thank you for that question. Um, and then bumping up the seasonal. So the seasonal is only the 1st of June through August 31st. I didn't want to go too high with the non-resident seasonal because I really think that's the family visiting Cape Cod that wants to have the experience. So they're really only doing it once and it's not oyster season. So I didn't want to price that out of that Cape Cod experience. Mm. Yeah. Um, plus there's not really any money to be made. There's only a handful of those. Yeah. So um, I want to point out, um, when I was reviewing all this, um, we do have a nice strong reserve fund, if you will. So the revolving fund has been doing really well. Um, but we do need to put a bunch of money out for capital. And that's kind of my plan for the next year. We need to um, re uh, do at least one flipsy. Um, which is quite pricey. Um, there's a seed sorter, a trash pump. There's a bunch of stuff that's getting quite old. So we are going to dig into that capital, but at the same time, we want to keep the revenue um, coming in to make up for these these changes. So that's kind of how I generally run these these accounts um, to keep them really strong. And then you're always positioned. Well, if something comes along, we can just jump on it. A new place that we can put a fluff seat. We've got that capital sitting there, and we don't have to worry. We can jump right right on it. So usually you don't raise fees when you're you're doing this well. But I think in this case, with this capital output that we need to do, I think it's it's appropriate. So. Any questions? No. Again, I just want to comment that, as I did before, about the commercial license is not increasing here. I mean, when everyone else is. Um, we can um, we can look at this again in a year. Make sure we put uh, fee increases on the um, agenda. But I do want to have some meetings before that, so that the draft that I bring forward, everybody's not, you know blown away by it. Good. Yep. And then we can look at that again. You can go ahead first if you want. Tim. Tim. Um, I'm just, when was the last time a commercial, kind of new in the commercial game, when did they raise those? Last? 2016. 2016. So that was across the board, they all went up. Mm -hmm. um, has there been any discussion, um, like if we're going to have the dredge 
in a bigger capacity? I mean, is there going to be an add-on for that for just a generation for us to pay if we get a dredge? I don't know. Additional he, tag and then... But previously, um, prior to having the one fee just for senior and for master permits, um, there was like a by species cost um, in some towns, especially on the islands, still have it broken out that way. Um, we could select your species you're harvesting, you're saying? So yeah, yeah, some towns still like still manage it that way. Um, it seemed most appropriate at some point in time before my time um, to have the one fee for a senior, you know, for a master permit and um, just for a regular master permit and it just covers you for all the species. But I mean, it's it's something that we could look at. Um, you know, it wouldn't be something that I'd be comfortable doing until we actually have the regulations in place for that future fishery. Um, you know, I don't want to charge people for something that may or you know may not you know work out. We don't we don't really have a good idea of like what's out there for this fishery in Cape Cod Bay and in Nantucket Sound. It's still very new, so um, I would like to have those regulations like ironed down before we would look at that type of an increase. I do have the the dates here. Um, we took a deep dive here. Uh, in 2000 is when we got rid of the species only permits, and then started in 06. Uh, <laughs> in 2016, um, the fee changed from 500 to 550. I'm not. sure. It doesn't talk about and 300 to 350. Three, three, yeah. So there yeah. was a small change. So I, I do think it is really appropriate to have another look at it. Yep. Was the 2000, I have a couple questions. Was uh, the 2000, was that when it also went to a closed fishery? Um, oh, I gave you that timeline before. Mm. I can dig it back out for you. Um, it was over the course of, I want to say, like maybe a six-year period mm -hmm. and might have started in the late 90s where it was like they started off with um, three people off out one, one in, in, and then eventually it just sort of leveled out mm -hmm. at 47. Um, and as Tom Arcati would say, by attrition, um, they just kept it. They made it one in, a one out, one in at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's still reasonable. You know, like only half you really use the permits on a regular basis. And I don't know if we had 47 people actively using the permits all the time that we could sustain that fishery. So. Um, you know, I think we're kind of in a good in a good spot. Um, but yeah, I want to say it was like maybe the late they had it for like a few years in the late '90s that so with the like three well. out one in, and then mm -hmm. from like 2000 to 2003 maybe mm -hmm. it became one out one in. But I can dig that timeline back up. For yeah, it's not, not a pressing issue. I'm just curious. And then um, as far as um, paying extra to go outside the cut. Um, I feel like it's not going to cost the town any money, and we're not using and we're not harvesting any grown clams. So yeah. uh, I don't see why there would be a cost extra yeah. to go out. You know what I mean? And yeah. do that. But and then one last final little question was: uh, What is like? I, what is the non-resident season? Like, what does that mean? So that's a permit that I was just speaking about. Yeah, so yeah. that's that's only from June first to August thirty-first. Okay. So. It's the one where the family comes from wherever that doesn't have shellfish, and they want to just try it. Mm -hmm. um, it isn't during oyster season, yeah. um, so it's really just would, to kind of capture that that little summer crowd. Would it be, I don't really have much of an opinion or one way or the other, just an idea, like would it be worth maybe for a little extra money during oyster season doing that same thing for like a day? Hmm. Like not a season, but like if it's Thanksgiving and you wanted to, go get oysters, but you don't want to get... Oh, we let them fill the gap and pay for a full year non-resident no, no, permit no. is what happens. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Fair <laughs> we definitely get that money back. Yeah. I didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> that is, so, yeah. That's another thing where then a lot of people who are like, oh, I'll just get the permit so okay. I can get a basket of oysters. For, sure. Then you're actually losing money. Good. Yeah. Sounds good. Good. So, um, like I said, if you guys are comfortable with this, you're welcome to vote on it tonight. If there's anything additional you want me to mess around with um, and put it back on the agenda for October. Um, the, <coughs> do I entertain a motion I, to vote I on this? I make a move so that we approve these changes to the shellfish fees. Anyone, anyone second that? Second. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone 
disagree, say nay. All right, it is approved. Super, so that means I'm going to present it to the town manager with the endorsement of this board, and then it goes to the town manager hearing, which is a public hearing, and then the public still has more opportunity to weigh in mm. to the directly to the town manager, and then he issues after 30 days his final decision. So this is the first step in that. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Good job. All right, um, on to the next upcoming and old proposed coastal projects. Uh, 128 Bluff Point Drive, Katuit is first. Yeah, so nobody, um, no representatives are here. This went before the commission um, just on Tuesday, so I don't, I didn't have an opportunity to watch to see what the outcome was. But ultimately, they are looking to repair, if you're familiar with the Bluff Point relay area, there's the amphibious vessel that's up against the bulkhead, and then that very long dock. And just past that dock is a degrading set of um, stairs and also some um, choir, you know, fiber rolls that had been installed as bank stabilization that are now being exposed. Um, all of the work that they're proposing is um, via the upland. Um, and so no shellfish survey even had to be done. Um, and so ultimately, natural resources didn't have any opposition to it. I think the only comment that Liz had made was that we'd be a part of them staking any work limit lines so that they don't, um, you know, enter into an intertidal. And, you know, we had that one instance um, in Hyannis where they were just like taking rocks from the old revetment and storing them on top of steamers and cohogs. So that, that type of stuff we now actively um, have a say in so that that's avoided. Um, but my assumption is is that probably was was approved. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions about it, but it wasn't it wasn't something that had any massive concern to us. Hmm. Why do they always do that? They approve it, then it comes to us anyways. So uh, that is a, an excellent question, and it's been asked to me many times over the years. And the conservation department and commission is actually held to statutes. So when they get an application for a proposed co like a proposed project, they have to put it to a hearing within two weeks of that submission. And so because of that, they meet more than once a month. Um, back in the day when this committee was extremely upset about missing out on them, and we met on the third. Wednesday of the month, it was, you know, we looked at when things were typically filed and going before the commission and found that at that point in time, it made more sense for us to meet the second Wednesday of the month because they'd have more of an opportunity because honestly, the temperature of this committee was not to meet more than once a month. Mm -hmm. So inherently, because they meet more than once a month, we're going to miss things. We don't always miss things. Um, but because we do, I have a tendency to, if I see something that I think is like red flags, I try to make mention of that when I send it out to the committee. And then what the committee can do is opt to have an emergency special meeting. Um, it still has to follow open meeting law, but if you see something that you're like, this is really contentious, you don't want to just go at it as an individual taking opposition to it, you can hold a special meeting as a committee to then like decide to write a letter on behalf of the entire committee before the hearing happens. So there is always that opportunity. We just haven't had anything like egregiously contentious no, in like crazy. probably close to a year mm -hmm. at this point. I think the last one that really riled people up was that dock to the left of Bay Street yes. landing. Yes. Yeah. And then there was the McKinnon Pier yeah. proposal. Oh, that was, was a that big pier. one. Yep. The one in, in Centerville River right through the yep. lake yep. Yep. That yep. was a dingy dock. Yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> those <laughs> ones we, we red flag and try to get, you know, involvement ahead of a hearing. Um, so there's always, you know, always that process. If you guys see something that you're like, oh, I don't like this, like we should probably meet and discuss and come together as a committee to oppose it prior to the hearing. There's always that option. Yeah. Or you can meet twice a month. Anyone? <laughs> no? I mean, I know we brought this up about not flipping back and forth, but if it was like an emergency meeting, could it be Zoom or not? Oh, you know what? I don't know, but I can ask. Yeah. I can find out. Good question. Um, so if nobody has any issues with this one, I'll move on to the second one, um, which is some um, Aton repair. And it looks like in the case of our town outright removal, um, 
repairs, removal, and replacement of existing aid to navigation structures in multiple municipalities, two of which are located in Barnstable, each consisting of remnant riprap mounds that once supported in-service navigational aids. Both riprap mounds will be removed permanently to be below mean low, low water. Um, and there's a, um, that is going to the commission um, on October 1st. Do we know where? Yep, yeah, that's my favorite to talk about. Collier Ledge. They're going to remove Collier's Ledge? Uh, no, it's no, navigational, no navigational. No navigational equipment exists. The rip rap oh, graduates down to. They're, getting rid of the they're literally going to get rid of that whole thing. Yeah, well, I mean, people keep driving, driving into it, so been there. probably not a bad idea. Yeah, that, that's a pile of rocks that the old sailboat schooners <laughs> picked up and took out of the... Way, way, that was there because of wooden yeah. sailing boats that wanted to make the harbor safer, and they put them all in a pile, and they've been there since the pil since people have been coming into the harbor, so that's what all those piles actually are. So they want to get rid of the piles? I can't believe they put energy into that. They like are. Either. There is a buoy there, but how about like people just, you know, or anyone can get a boat. Or, I That's know. a thing. How about people? Anyone can get a car, drive down the road, drunk. Why don't you just fish habitat? That yeah. 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 That's it's huge. huge. That's huge. That's it is big. The there's eelgrass. There's eelgrass all around. Oh yeah. And uh, this one is the Southwest Rock Day Beacon. Wow. Is oh, a failed aton near the south coast of Barnstable in Nantucket Sound. Um, it has been superseded by an addition danger rocks marker buoy. I haven't heard any like harbor master response this year out to there for people driving into it, but they've been out to Collier's a lot oh, yeah. this summer. That a is lot, a, a big lot, spot. a lot. But why all of a sudden when we'd been there since for I don't even know hun hundreds of years, a <laughs> hundred years, like. Um, well, I mean, this one has not gone before the commission yet. Yeah. So if you want, I mean, obviously there's nobody here from the Coast Guard <laughs> to explain the project, but they do have a contact, and that contact is listed in the beginning of um, the NOI. So if you wanted any more information, you could reach out to Christine Perron. Um, I did call and leave her voicemail to find out what date it was going to the commission, and that is, in fact, how her last name is said. So. The Coast Guard like thing? Yeah, so she's the one who's like uh, the representative the for the Coast on. Guard. The Coast Guard. Okay. Yeah. So the Coast Guard's the one that wants it out. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yep. As far as we go, I mean, mm -hmm. is there. The buoy used to be real close to it. Now it's a shrimp. Is there like a shellfish? Yeah. It's much no. Like there's nothing we can kind of vote on as far as. So there were no like shellfish surveys done for yeah. this. It's literally like they're their old navigational aids that they're it's deciding rocks. to rem no remove. Yeah. So I mean, even if fish we. It could be. Absolutely. It's but, fish habitat. But there's no like ground for us to oh, write a note so. to them to be, you know. No, I mean, you could, you could, you know, as, as a person who's involved in more than just, mm -hmm. you know, wild harvest of, of shellfish for this town, could definitely, I would say, you know, reach out and you mm -hmm. would, you would have more grounds to ask those types of questions than we necessarily would. Yeah. Talk to Brian? Or uh, talk no, to, or yeah, that, I, would that go, contact? I would go straight to, to okay. Christine, yeah. Okay. It was just a question about you. Know, Definitely worth it. Grass, you know, oh, no, Jake said. Yeah. Our side of that. Yeah. You know, uh, Collier's Ledge. The whole yeah. Our side before the drop off is all eelgrass right up to the rocks. Mm. Which I imagine will also be something that Division Marine Fisheries will weigh in on because yeah. they don't let you just like tear up eelgrass. No. But so they'll, I'm sure there'll be like work limitations to protect existing eelgrass buds. Mm -hmm. um, I was shocked to see it. I went scuba diving at Collier's Ledge and I went down. I was like, you kidding me? Yeah. I thought eelgrass was gone. It was like as far as I could go, like in all northern, east, what, like north areas of that flat. We still got to get out there and yeah. check yeah. that out. Yeah. We're planning on going out hopefully again at the end of this month to kind of wrap up our monitoring for the season. So um, we'll try to get out there to check cool. that out. Is that it? Uh, for notices of intent, yep. yes. All um, right. Um, old business. 
have to vote on that or anything? No. no. Just no. we're aware of it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, what, that's the beginning process of that? Yeah, I mean, there's Just nobody, the there's no representative here, and I'm not very comfortable presenting on, like, the Coast Guard's plan for gotcha. their old um, navigational aids myself. Um, so I would say, you know, if you want more information on it, to reach out to the representative. Um, because, yeah, I, I am not the person to present that on behalf of the Coast Guard. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Quite and simply what put. Day, what day was it going to? October 1st. And are they still Zoom? Are they, they are, yeah. Until, no until they are forced yeah. to go back in person, <laughs> they will be via Zoom. So there should be a representative explaining the project as well. Yep. Very trusted. It yeah. Is, it is curious. It is. How it do is. You get it's Zoom one that I'm interested in, in tuning into. So okay. how do you get that Zoom invitation if you wanted to? Zoom oh, um, the oh. easiest way is to go to the town calendar, which is like right across the top of when you go to home, you get the town calendar. Okay. And then when you go to the date, and you click on that, it has the Zoom invitation there. That's, for me, the easiest. You can go through the Com- Conservation Commission website as well. Yeah, they do have all of their, they're really good at putting materials onto their website ahead of their meetings um, at the request of many people during the pandemic, especially. Um, and so if you scroll down to whatever day on the Conservation Commission's website, they're having that meeting, there'll be the Zoom information usually like I think a week out um, and the agenda and meeting materials are also available there. It'd be interesting just to listen to it. Yeah, it is, it is an interesting one for sure. Uh, any other, anything else? All right, uh, old business, status of repair of Scudder Lane Town Landing. I have, I have, I have no information. Yeah, perfect. Um, I know um, the previous chair had recommended that this stay on the agenda every single month in perpetuity. Um, you can keep it that way, should you like, and I'll just keep having no information every month. Um, or you could make a request that I bring forth information when information is available. I, does everyone agree with that? Sure. I, sure I, I agree I with think that. We'll, I'm uh, emotional for that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, proposed regulation changes for discussion. Yeah. Uh, so these were this, the same ones that I presented at the meeting last month. Um, looking at getting rid of the uh, weekday prohibitions between the May 15 and, uh, yeah, like the the harvest restrictions for the south side, um, for soft shell clams, um, for the north side, for cohogs and for soft shell clams. Um, You know, you you guys saw the charts, you see the people out there. Um, I think putting extra prohibitions on a 47-person fishery when we have, you know, close to 3,000 people that can go out there three times a week and get what they want to, you know, out of their permit just doesn't really seem to make sense to me anymore. Um, So I was hoping um, this month you might be willing to take a vote on them um, so that they can, you know, go to a public hearing um, with your support. Does anyone have any questions about them? I, I kind of went into you know much greater detail with it last month. Um, I make a motion to approve the well, yeah, go ahead. Um, regulations that Amy has presented. Um, anyone second that? I'll second it. All, right. All in favor say aye. 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 All not in favor say nay. All right, motion approved. Thank you. So we'll get a public hearing scheduled, and then, you know, I'll notify everybody about that ahead of time. A legal ad goes out two weeks ahead of any public hearings that are held for shellfish-related items, um, and that legal ad is posted in the Barnstable Patriot. But at this point, I'll take the regulations, you know, because they have your blessing, put them up on the town website for probably close to a month so the general public who doesn't tune into these meetings and who hasn't seen this have an opportunity to see them. Um, and, you know, we'll have ample time ahead of a public hearing to give their two cents should they have any. All right. Uh, matters not reasonably anticipated by the chair. Seeing none. Uh, Move that we adjourn. Any seconds? I'll second. All right. Meeting over. <laughs> Vote. Oh, sorry. Aye. Sorry. Excuse me. All in favor aye. say aye. Aye. Someday we will get 
ending a meeting, correct. I have faith in this committee. I it will do. take me a couple times, mm -hmm. okay? It will take everybody else a couple Everyone times. Everyone be patient, all right? We've been doing it wrong for years. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely not a politician, so this is completely new to me. Thanks for stepping up. We are up all done. <laughs>